This is the last Sunday uh, for our a series on, on suffering. <clears throat> Before I pray, I want to I want to start by reading some scripture here. Uh, you know, it's uh, there's the old adage. Yes, it's an old adage, I guess, that when you teach, uh, that there are three things that you do. You tell everybody what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them which makes it kind of an easy thing to do. But I'm gonna start this morning with what I'm going to tell you. I wanna read from Romans, uh, Romans 8, beginning in verse 18, and we'll read a few verses here. <clears throat> For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, Adam, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So that's what I'm going to tell you. And now let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for another day uh, to gather with your people, to uh, study your word, to worship, to bring glory to your name, to be edified as your people. And Lord, even today we're reminded as as even Mike and Carol are ill that we still suffer uh, we still suffer in our bodies we still suffer spiritually we we thank you that at this time in our in in the life of our country that we don't really suffer physically for our faith we thank you for that we pray that uh, this morning that you would you would bring healing and relief to Mike and Carol, uh, for others that suffer, for Suzanne Nyman as she approaches surgery this week, and for all the others, Lord, that, that chronically suffer uh, among us. We just ask that uh, you would bring glory to your name through their suffering. And we pray that you would teach us now as we look into your word and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> so this last uh, chapter that we're looking at is... is it's called a vision of things to come. And, and we really just read from Romans 18 that, that this is a vision of things to come. It's something that we hope for. And if, and if you, you hope for it, you don't hope for what you see, really, as Romans tells us. You hope for what you do not see. And so Ryan told us last week that we're going to change gears a little bit. And we, and we are shifting gears here because we're not going to look particularly at suffering how we suffer or the things that we suffer but we're going to look at a vision of things to come what where, where are we headed uh, with all of our suffering now i think at some point in the past i've told you all about this little book and i've i've used it some this morning because it's it's really very interesting and i think very applicable to this whole subject this is a little book by albert woters called creation regained and it's really a world view book a world view on, on uh, the the reformational reformed christian worldview but i'm going to use it a, a little bit here uh, this morning um, why do we get sad and disappointed when those things that comfort us or, or give us security and happiness are taken away i want you to think about that for a minute why why do we get sad why does death hurt so much when someone close to us dies 
Or maybe not even us. Maybe we see someone else hurting because of a death of somebody that we don't know. Why, why do we hurt? Why did Jesus weep at Lazarus' tomb? He was about to raise him from the dead. I mean, he had the power to do all things. Why did Jesus, why did he weep? Just before he was to glorify himself and, and his father by raising a man from the dead. Why did Jesus weep when he looked down on Jerusalem? He said, I would have, I would have gathered you, but, but you were not willing. Anybody have any thoughts about why those things happen? Just in a gut level? Yeah, we're going to talk about a number of the things that you, that you just mentioned there. We're going to talk about the separation a little bit. And you've alluded to it. I'm going to put it in a little different, in a little different way. And I, I've really been intrigued by some reading uh, that I've done on this. Uh, l let's answer it this way and, and see if you agree. We're not made for that. We were not made for death. We were not made for suffering. We were made for the world that Adam and Eve were placed in and corrupted. And so they brought all of this into the world. And, and as we just read, now the creation groans. We groan, but we were not made for this. That's why it hurts so much. This is not the way it's supposed to be. And inside, we know that. We know that it's just not the way it's supposed to be. So the suffering, and, and, I'm, gonna, and I'm gonna say that's very broad. It, it, covers, it covers a multitude of things uh, that are in the world that shouldn't be. Um, is part of the curse. And that curse uh, is, is maybe described uh, actually by suffering. We suffer separation from God, as we've just heard. We suffer separation from God. We suffer separation from one another. We suffer, suffer separation from good health, separation from happiness, etc. Our world suffers because of confusion about God's created order, even now. I mean, we're suffering uh, because of that. We're suffering uh, because we no longer understand what men and women are, for instance. What marriage really is, what authority means, what responsibility is. We're separated from an understanding of all of these things. But when Jesus came, he, he did something. <clears throat> he preached that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, right? He told us the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he preached the good news. But how did Jesus confirm himself or authenticate himself? Yeah, the, the, the miraculous things that he did, right? And so, what, what did he do by performing miracles? I'm going to say that he 
restored something, did he not? Uh, so he restored life. It was a restoration of life in the case of Lazarus. Uh, it was a restoration of health in the case of Peter's mother and others. It was a restoration of a right mind when he healed the demoniac. Uh, when he forgave sin, what was he doing? He was restoring a right relationship with the Father. This is interesting. Every miracle that we have recorded in the New Testament that Jesus performed, except for the cursing of the fig tree, every one was a restoration. Every one was a restoring of creation, if you will. <clears throat> so Jesus, Woder says this book, Jesus shows us the meaning of redemption the freeing of creation from the shackles of sin and evil, and a reinstatement of creaturely living as intended by God. That's what Jesus came and did. So as we look, look at this, as we look to the future and think of this, this vision of the future, I want us to think restoration, <laughs> restoration. Uh, in fact, uh, we see throughout the scriptures, we see this, this, this whole prefix, if you will, of re-something. Which, which, what does re, what, it, so re, what does that mean? What does that mean to you when we say we're going to restore something? Well, it means we're going to, yeah, you want to, that's right, bring it back to its original state, uh, if you will. That's right. So in salvation, we are regenerated, regenerated. We're called upon to repent, to be re-reconciled, to be renewed. We have been redeemed. Uh, we have been remade into Christ's likeness. And we are being, we have been, and are being restored. Us and, and the creation. So it's interesting <clears throat> that the Greek word, you know, when we talk about, uh, in, in theology, we talk about the theory or, or, or the uh, doctrine of salvation. It is soteriology. The doctrine of, of salvation in theology is called soteriology. Well, the Greek word for salvation is soteria. But the meaning of the Greek word is health or security after sickness or danger. The first English translation of the Bible, the Tyndall uh, translation, 1525, regularly rendered this word soteria as health, as health. Um, so Christ is the great physician, and he heals the sickness that leads to death or restores our health. Now, all of these words suggest that something good in the original was lost. So when we talk about a new heaven and a new earth or the vision of things to come, think of it like this. And this is something that Woters pointed out. It's just, I think, a, just a powerful, a powerful way to look at this. God the Father refuses to abandon the work of his hands. In fact, he sacrifices his own son to save his original project. Just a terrific way, I think, to think about the way things are to be. And so 
The one more re that I want you to think about as we, as we look at this a little bit further, in the things to come, and this is really important, and, we, and I think Ryan talked about this, like there's a removal of what? There's a removal of what that leads to suffering? There's a removal of the curse. There's a removal, removal uh, of the curse. You know, Jesus said in John 16, 33, he was talking to his, his disciples just before he launches in, into the high priestly prayer. I have told you these things. This is John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have trouble. You will have tribulation. You will have suffering. All of these things are in the world. And then, but he ends it like this. Take heart. Take heart. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. I will remove the curse. I will restore. I have overcome the world uh, as it is. So I want to look now at, uh, at what Sproul says uh, a little bit about the about um, the characteristics of the heavenly city, um, which is, this is in Revelation 21 and 22 primarily, but I just want to briefly want to look at these. We may get through a little bit early, but if we do, we'll just have an extra cup of coffee. <clears throat> so, um, Sproul po points these out in his book, and, and these, are, these are characteristics now that, that we see, you know, heaven, we see heaven coming down, the new Jerusalem coming down. So we first of all see what he calls the redeemed city in Revelation 21 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So who was the bride? Who was the bride of God, Yahweh, in the Old Testament? Israel. Israel was, was the bride of Yahweh in the Old Testament. And we, and we, and we read about that. We, we, you know, we read so often about the adultery of, of Israel, how they left, they left their, their husband, Yahweh and committed adultery with all the foreign gods and, and foreign lands. Well, we believe in, 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 the, in Reformed theology, the way of thinking that, that the church now represents uh, Israel. Uh, in, in, in the New Testament, the church is called the what? The Bride of Christ. And so, uh, Revelation 19, in fact, as we, we go back a couple of chapters, we see it talking about the, excuse me, the marriage supper of the Lamb. But the chief feature of, of this redeemed city, this new Jerusalem, will be the immediate presence of God, which we're going to talk about uh, just a little bit more uh, in a bit. In Ezekiel, all the way back in, in Ezekiel 40, 48, uh, verse 35, he says, the name of the city, if you remember what he said the name of the city would be? The name of the city shall be God is there. That's the name of the city. The Lord is there. Uh, God is there. The second characteristic that, that Sproul points out of this new city that's coming down, uh, we read about in Revelation 21, 4, and that is all sorrow. And, you know, we <clears throat> when we started this study, we were talking about the whole idea of suffering, sorrow, pain, death, all of these things that, that are, <clears throat> are part of the curse. One of the characteristics of the heavenly city, as it comes down, is the end, the end of all sorrow and, and we see it in Revelation 21 4 there shall be no more pain 
for the former things have passed away. So think about that. That our consolation will, will be a permanent consolation with no more sorrow. I mean, that's just unbelievable. I mean, if you think about it, it's unbelievable. We have all, everyone is by some sign of sorrow, even, even something that is, is really profound, uh, if it's not physical or whatever, it, it's profound. Some of the sorrows that, that, we, have, that we have faced in, in body, in spirit, in relationships, whatever it is, just profound sorrow and just to think that there will be no more sorrow. We go down one more verse to, 20, to verse 5, and it says, Behold, Jesus says, Behold, I'm making all things new. Or, let's put it another way, for what we've discussed about re, I am renewing, I am renewing uh, all things. So, how can we be sure of that? What if God told you, we don't believe he does that now, uh, except through his scriptures, but what if God somehow told you, came to you in a vision and said, write this down. What would you think? That God wanted you to write this down. That's what he says to John in Revelation 5. And he, I forgive my sniffling, I am, I'm not contagious, I'm just getting over some sinus stuff. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, John. Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. So, the Lord God comes along and tells John, write this down. Write this down. These words are true and they're trustworthy. So true, true, we're going to, what is truth? Well, truth, in our way of thinking, it's what really corresponds to reality, what really is, okay? So these words are true. They correspond to reality. And he said, they're trustworthy. So God tells you, they're trustworthy. They're faithful. And, and what does that mean coming from the mouth of God? There is no fear of disappointment here. These words are trustworthy. And then, one verse later, he says, it is done. It is done. So there is a goal. There is a goal for us in suffering, in life. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. <clears throat> and then, to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. And then in verse 7, the one who conquers will have, he did not say might have, I'm considering it. He said the one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. I want to make one comment here uh, that's a bit of a rabbit trail, but I just want to make a, a, a comment about it. <clears throat> we, hear, we hear a lot about what we, um, what people refer to as secondary issues. Uh, in the church, that, that they don't really make that much difference. 
And I, and I don't want to get off, I mean, I, I really think that, that, that sexuality issues are, are the, the, some of the foundations, uh, if, or the foundation of some, some of the curse that we see in, in Genesis 3. But there are lots of issues, and we hear, well, Jesus didn't speak about that, and so, you know, that's a secondary issue. He didn't speak about that, that's a secondary issue. But after Jesus tells us that, you know, you can, you can come and, and have the water of life without payment, he says in verse 8, um, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And the only comment I want to make is a lot of things that we consider as, quote, secondary issues, the scriptures tell us are a matter of life and death. <clears throat> That's all I want to say about that. Um, so, <clears throat> Sproul basically notes that that little list is just a summary, just a summary of, of, of those that are united with the Antichrist. We hear also about this city that it's, its walls are of jasper and its gates of pearl. You know, that's where, that's where we get, that's where we get the pearly gates is right out of this, this part of, of Revelation. And, and Sproul makes a very interesting comment ab about this. He says these images are probably symbolic of the glory that will be present in heaven. But he says he shrinks from being dogmatic about it, which I thought was, was very interesting. I mean, could we see these sorts of things in heaven? You know, pearls that are that big or streets of gold, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, it, it's an interesting thought. There's another characteristic <clears throat> of, the, uh, of, of the new heaven, and then it's this. There's a conspicuous absence of the temple. Now, what was the temple for? Yeah, it, yeah, and it's where, it's where the priests went to meet with God. The people went to meet with God. Uh, in the temple, but there's a conspicuous absence of the temple in Revelation. 21, 22 says, I saw no temple in it. That is John speaking. I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Are its temple. The temple is replaced again, as we said at the very beginning, by the immediate presence of God. And you know, we don't see this just in Revelation. This is the way the scriptures fit together. It's the way the scriptures fit together. Isaiah said in Isaiah 60, verse 9, the sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. <clears throat> so we see that heaven really is, is far more than a simple restoration of the original. Now Sproul says this, and I'm going to come back to this point towards the end of, of, our, of our lesson. Future paradise will far exceed the felicity or the intense happiness that was enjoyed in the pristine Eden. How often have you thought, how often have you thought, and I've thought it, how often have you thought that, well, it'd be great to go back to Eden, to be in Eden, and, that's, and it's going to be that good. It's going to be that good. I want to come back to that. Sproul says it's going to be 
better than that. And we're going to look at maybe why that's the case. And another characteristic of, of, of where we're headed is the removal of the curse. So again, Revelation 22 now says, there should be no more curse. There should be no more curse. For the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. So, what did the curse do? Again, we'll we go back to what Denise even said earlier. What, what did the curse fundamentally do? It wasn't just a loss of positive blessings. It, it did something else. What, what did it fundamentally do? Separated us from God. Uh, fundamentally, that's what the curse did. And what happened? What, what happened on the cross? What did Jesus cry out with his last breath? The, how have you, Eloi, Eloi, Lene Sabachthani, whatever. Hmm? Why, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So the ultimate curse was, was being cut off, cut off uh, from God's presence. Um, that was the penalty of our sin. And that's what Christ bore on the cross. He, he, he bore our sin, which ultimately was, was being cut off uh, from the presence of God. And so the end of the curse, the end of the curse signals that the, the, the full consummation of, of the redemptive process, of divine redemption, is the end of the curse. When the curse is gone, I was going to put this in a syllogism, but I haven't done that. So Adam could put this in a syllogism for me. So when the curse is gone, Sin will be gone because sin was the cause of the curse. Okay? Um, and then in, in Revelation 22 4, and this is very interesting. I mean, you start thinking about this, and the scriptures just finally just go, whoop, the lights, the lights begin to come on as you think about all these scriptures that, that you've read about. Uh, studied and looked at through the years. So, Revelation 22, 4 follows on, on verse 3 where it says there should be no more curse. It says this, we shall see his face. So think about my foot hurting, think about your feet hurting, your, all of the problems that you've got, and to think that that, and we talked about this a little bit last, I think it was last week, about you know, spiritual eyes and you know what it is to to be in the spirit or in the body and how do we see things spiritually and, and that sort of thing but but it says here that we shall see his face and th that is in theology that's called the beatific vision um, remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 8, he's talking about blessed are, are you, blessed is this, blessed is that. Bless. He said one thing about those who would see God. You remember what that is? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So, as Sproul points out here, this is not an eye problem. This is not a vision issue. This is a heart issue. This is a heart issue. And we read throughout the scriptures, particularly in the Old Testament, but throughout the scriptures, who, can, who, who has seen God face to face? No one. No one has seen God face to face. 
Um, <clears throat> why would that be? Now, we have theophanies. We have theophanies, you know, where, where we think that maybe Jesus appears as a certain individual, uh, but, but nobody sees God face to face. And, and, and why, why did God say that you couldn't see him face to face? You die. You die. You die. You'd be destroyed. But in heaven, we see him. In 1 John 3, 1 and 2, it tells us that though we're God's children, there's more to be revealed. It says, we shall see him as he is because we shall be like him. We will finally, finally be pure in heart. We don't, we, we're not going to see God in this life because we're not pure in heart. But we will be pure in heart. We are God's images now. Yes, we are. But we're, as Sproul points here, we're lying images. We lie. <laughs> you might say, kind of, you lie. Um, we're lying images. <clears throat> when sin is removed, we will be authentic images. Pain and suffering will vanish from our memory. You think about that. If you, if suddenly you were to behold the face of God, as we read in Romans 18, uh, Romans 8, if you behold the face in God, what do you think? I mean, do you think your suffering is going to be at the forefront of your mind? I mean, think of the profound the nature of that, that you see God face to face, however that is. And I'm, I'm not saying, gracious me, I mean, I don't know how that takes place uh, in a spiritual way or realm. I, I, I don't know. <clears throat> but all I know, I can tell you that if I was to see him face to face, I wouldn't worry about much of anything else. It would not be in the forefront uh, of my mind. <clears throat> now I want to come back to something here and then, then we'll end it for a little discussion if you have any. Um, th this I want to come back to the point about uh, heaven is, is more than a return to Eden. It's in a sense better. How can that be? The serpent was in Eden, yes. So the serpent won't be there. <clears throat> have you ever thought that, you know, wow, what it would be like to have been in Eden? I mean, I thought about that. I thought about what it looked like, what it would be like uh, to tend the ground and you know, it, and things would flourish. And I mean, I thought, gracious, returning to Eden would be fabulous stuff. This was looked at, and philosophers have looked at this forever, and, and Augustine described this as the four stages of man. And, and these are the four stages. And, and this might channel Sproul because these are Latin phrases. But <clears throat> in, in Eden, Adam and Eve were what were called posse picar. They were able to sin. I mean, obviously they were able to sin. But they were also posse non picar. They were able to not sin. So that was the pre-fall humanity. Posse Picard, Posse non Picard. And then we fell. And in the fall, we became non Posse 
non bakar. We were not able not to sin. So, post fall man is not able not to sin. So, I think you can look around the world right now and say, yep, non posse, non pacar. But the redeemed or the reborn have returned, if you will, or have been given, if you will, a pre-fall state, okay? Through the Holy Spirit, we are now posse pacar and posse non pacar. We are able not to sin. We're able to sin, obviously, but we're able not to sin through the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but what is the glorified state? Now, we would say that the reborn, as, as we are now, we, we're back in Eden. We are posse pacar and posse non pacar. Okay? But what is the glorified state of man? And this is what makes it better than Eden. We are non posse Picard. We are not able to sin in the glorified state. That's, those are the four stages of humanity according to Augustine and others. But that makes it better than Eden is we're non posse Picard. We are not able to sin. Now think about that. I mean, gracious me. Uh, not able to sin. So, remember these, these things about this lesson, about suffering, and now about a vision of the future. Remember what the Lord told John. He said, write it down. Take it to the bank. All doubt is removed. And then there's this simple gospel presentation that I read in verse 18. Uh, in verse 17 uh, of Revelation, you know, come to me. You, water without price. Water without price. There's, there is the free offer of grace uh, and mercy by the Lord. So, I told you what I was going to tell you. Now I've told you, and I'm going to tell you one more time. The pain and suffering that we endure is not worthy to be compared to the glory that God has stored up for us in heaven. Not worthy to be compared. And Psalm 84 would put it in a different way. Psalm 84.10 One day, <laughs> one day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. And just think that we will be every day in his courts. Every day in his courts. If you're in Christ, every day in his courts. So any questions or discussions uh, about that? Any comments? Adam. Yes. And so there won't be any more earthquakes and whatever. All other effects of the curse that we deal with just because we're in a fallen world, the world will be fine. Right. And so we we will be in a a state where um, every sunset will be glorious and I'll never be more about it. Yeah. If that makes sense. No, no, it makes perfect sense. And I didn't get into that so much. Uh, but you're exactly right. And I don't think we should forget it. I mean, that's a whole discussion in itself that there will be, we will have physical bodies. We will have a physical earth. Uh, and, and so, yeah, we, we you know, the, the boring thing would be to be an angel flying around on a cloud for the rest of eternity. 
you know, that, that's not what the Bible says. Uh, there, will be, there, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And you're right. I mean, the, the creation groans, as we, as we read in that Romans 8. The creation groans, waiting for what? Waiting for us to be redeemed. And, and it will be redeemed. The lion and the lamb will lie down together. All sorts of scriptures about that. That's a good point. Really good point. Richard. Confused by the uh, statement in verse 19 there in uh, chapter 8 about the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. It's as if it's saying that the creation has a consciousness. I mean, in the, how do you interpret that? No, I, I don't. I don't. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't interpret that as... as uh, being a, a consciousness. I, I mean, I, I just think that it's making the point actually that Adam was just making that... The, is it just a figurative... I think it is. I, I think it's a figure, a figure of speech uh, that we would say about anything that... Well, it's, they're not inanimate. I mean, they do grow, but any, anything that's not human. Uh, so I, I think it's just as Adam was pointing out, it's just the creation is going to be, be redeemed. There are some interesting, by the way, there are some very interesting questions at the end of this book. If you don't, we don't have time to go through them here. We're over. But uh, if you don't have the book, the questions at the end of the book are very interesting. Like, do dogs go to heaven? <laughs> do, do our pets go to heaven? Uh, and, and does someone who commits suicide go to heaven? Uh, who, who, I mean, there, there are some very interesting questions uh, at the end of at the end of the book about that, I encourage you to look at those because they can they're they're very good. The answers I think are spot on. Thank you very much. Uh, next week uh, we'll start a new series. I think Mike will start that series. Lord willing, Mike will be back with us. Uh, Mike will start that series, and if he isn't, I bet our brother Matthew will be uh, standing in as he is this morning. So keep keep all of these people in your prayers, please. Thank you. Enjoy some coffee.